What, what I kind of wanted to do today was just take a little step back from what you're normally used to hearing when you come into Rob Auditorium. And I, and I wanted to bring in a, uh, somebody, talk for about a half hour, 45 minutes, just to kind of, not a retired four star, not a senior leader, not anybody, but a guy that was a platoon sergeant um, and, was, and was severely wounded while serving in that, in that position. And talk a little bit about his own experience, about his own personal resiliency, about overcoming things when they get to be really difficult. Maybe some little insights for you all about uh, platoon leader, platoon sergeant relation. Could be something else you'd, you'd ask about. But um, again, I just think a, a, a neat and very real discussion on, uh, on getting through hard times, to be quite honest, and leading through adversity. So Master Sergeant retired Cedric King, uh, I had this, the, the honor of serving with him when I was a battalion commander. He was one of my platoon sergeants. I always took great pride as a battalion commander in, in the view that the center of gravity in my unit was the platoon sergeants. And that, that may not sat so well sometimes with company commanders and first sergeants and platoon leaders, but I felt like if I got great platoon sergeants, I'm going to have a great battalion. And that's because of their impact on what I used to call first-termers. New soldiers, new non-commissioned officers, and new officers. Nobody has a more profound impact on all three of those groups of people than a good, than a good platoon sergeant. He's going to make those soldiers feel special, like they're part of a great organization. He's going to make junior NCOs, new E5s better as non-commissioned officers, and he's, and he's going to make that, that lieutenant, him or her, awesome. Um, and he was one of them. He was a great, great platoon sergeant for me. Set the example in all areas, held others accountable, humble, demonstrated empathy, started out in the aviation side of the house and then became an infantryman, went to ranger school, uh, recycled a bunch of times like I did, and, uh, and then went on to compete in the best ranger competition, I think twice. Um, but always, and genuinely cared for those that he led. And that was what I think set him apart. Always was optimistic, positive um, leader. And then on a subsequent deployment, unfortunately, while out of patrol, stepped on a, on a pressure plate IED and lost both his legs. One in above the knee, amputee, one below the knee. Uh, was, was rushed to Walter Reed. Uh, I was, had since changed out of battalion command and I was in Washington, D.C. on a, in lieu of being at the War College, I was on a fellowship at a think tank. And I raced over to, to Walter Reed to see Cedric, uh, probably a day after he got in. And it was hard looking at a guy who I knew was this absolute physical specimen that loved leading soldiers to see his life so drastically change. But I knew because of my experience with him that he was going to make this into an opportunity to have an impact beyond what maybe he would have had in the Army. I know he's probably got mixed emotions because his peers are battalion command sergeants majors now, maybe brigade command sergeant majors, but the impact he's had and the uh, example he sets for others is absolutely profound. 21 months after that day, he ran the Boston Marathon. First double amputee to do that. That's a lot of hard work when you think about that. 21 months, has gone on to run multiple marathons, has helped to advise uh, Carolina Panthers, Fortune 500 companies. I think he could have been out at Facebook this week, but he, uh, he, he took an opportunity to come up here and, uh, and uh, talk to you all. He's a, he's a source of motivation for me. You know, when I think things are, are tough or something's going uh, extraordinarily difficult, I think about what this, uh, what this man's been through and how he's overcome it, how it's impacted his relationship with his family, with others, um, and he's going to share with you a little bit today about what he went through, um, how he overcame these, these challenges, what the Army did to help prepare him to do that, and I'd encourage you all to think about some, uh, some questions, uh, you know, afterwards as he, as he concludes this, but if we could give a round of applause for Master Sergeant Cedric King. Go ahead and cue the video.
My name is Master Sergeant Cedric King, U.S. Army, retired from Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up, uh, you know, when you grow up poor, you don't know you're poor. <laughs> and uh, we didn't have a lot. It's my mom and it's me. But my mom always told me we were rich. She said, you know, we're rich, right? I said, Mom, we're not rich. She said, yeah, we are rich. So we got everything we need and more. We got love. We're very wealthy when it comes to love. A lot of my friends were, were going to jail. Um, a lot of them were, weren't doing the best things with their life. And I can remember, I, I could not, I made a conscious decision that could not be me. Uh, I had to take a different path. And the military was one of those paths. When I came in the military is when I truly learned a sense of what it is to love country. You begin to love this country. You begin to love what it stands for. It began to love uh, that, that people had to fight for this way of life. People died for this way of life. And, I, and I, I found out that I could be a winner in the military, but also I could be a winner in life. Uh, at some point, I can remember in walks some guy with uh, a ranger tab on his left shoulder pocket, on his left shoulder. And I said, what in the world is that? Something on the inside of me was like, well, that's what I'm going to do. Afghanistan is the wild, wild west. Uh, you're going through a village that you've never been in before. Booby traps everywhere. Everybody looks like they are getting ready to shoot at you. During this day, I can remember uh, something feeling different. We're going to go and do like a reconnaissance. But the place where we're going to do the reconnaissance is a pretty nasty spot. You know, everything's basically going according to plan. We've got a digital camera out. We're taking notes. We're going to be done early today. I make a decision to go back outside and be without a perimeter. And when I do, it was almost like... I stepped on that IED, it digs a hole about, about two or three feet deep. If this is my day, at least let me be able to just say goodbye to those two little girls and that wife of mine. That mother who raised me, let me at least be able to say goodbye to him, you know? Nobody I know that's been a double amputee has made it. A helicopter comes in, they put like a, a mask over me and I'm, uh, I'm like out for the count. And I go into, I slip into a coma. I just remember waking up uh, that the life that you had, it's not there anymore. It's like, it's pure, pure torture, man. I couldn't make peace with it. I was in the hospital for three years. We need you to be dad again. I began to, to find the, the peace in the storm. What is this trying to teach me? This is the greatest gift because it taught me how to be a better me. It taught me how to be a better father, how to, how to say I love you and really mean it. You see, who we really are is not what we do. I had to find that out the hard way. This in here made up for this out here. So all I have to do now is love deeper. All I have to do now is encourage more. All I have to do is just be more of who I already am. I, I could do that. I'm coming back to do the ultimate things. I'm coming back to be even better than I was before. You got to dominate that part on the inside that says you ain't enough. 
even though it stings and it hurts, it's gonna suck. Just keep pushing yourself, because you'll be proud of what you become in the, in the process. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Can you guys hear me? All right. Today, this is, this is first of all, an honor to be here. General Buzzard, thank you one more time uh, for having me come out. This is an honor to address uh, a fighting force that's about to go into our nation's uh, defense. So this is an honor, and I don't take it lightly, so thank you. Uh, I, I know there's just about all of you are they're getting ready to go forward uh, in, in, in May, pretty soon, and you guys are going to be a part of our fighting force. So what I want to do is, as a platoon sergeant, as a first sergeant, I want to come before you and let you know that these are the things that I know if you were to do them, they would significantly enhance your success. Significantly. From an enlisted point of view. This is the way that I see it. So if you have your writing utensils, go ahead and pull out. I'm not going to have you writing all day. And my first tip is this. I'm getting right down to the nitty gritty. Right down to the nitty gritty. And it's pretty easy on this first one. Be at the right place, be at the right time, have the right uniform, and have the right attitude. These four things, if you are able to consistently execute these four things, you will be a success not just at your first unit, not just at your second unit, not just in the army, but after the army. Even in the club, these things work. Even at the bar, these things work. They work virtually everywhere. Be at the right place. It's going to be so many times in the next year or two where you have to be at the right place. I'm pretty sure right now you're given a location, be somewhere. You must be there. To the best of your ability, be there. And sooner or later, you're going to get those premonitions, not just where to be at, but where to be at at the right place. Location is one thing, but being at the right place is all another thing. When you start looking at the, at the, at the intricacies of how to be at the right place, and you'll get a feel for it. The right time, at the right time. As a lieutenant, yes, you're going to have to be at places where it's even more constraining than the time limits you have now. Be at the right time. Right uniform. Have a good haircut if you're getting haircuts. Make sure your uniform looks good. Enlisted people, they look at your uniform and we look for deficiency. We just do that. We just do that. Every enlisted guy here is probably telling you, hey, you need to tie your shoelaces. Hey, you need to go get a haircut. Get your rank, straighten out your rank. Fix your shoes. We're all, we're, we're, we're all looking at how you look and how you look is a it's a little bit about how you are. It says a lot about how, who you are and how you are. The uniform and the right attitude. Now, the right attitude is something that can overcome the previous three for good or for bad. Right place, right time, right uniform, bad attitude. It, it means nothing that the first three were solid. What I do not want to hear from a lieutenant, from an officer, from a service member is complaining. It's complaining. It's a virus. It's a virus when you complain. It's cancerous to the culture. You complaining does nothing for the outcome, the success of the mission. The right attitude says, even when things are going wrong, I know if we stay here long enough with the right attitude, things will go right. The right attitude says, yes, it's raining, but because it's raining, things are going to go a little bit easier for, the, for us because the next guy is probably feeling sorry for himself. It's freezing cold out here. That's an advantage for us. 
The water is pretty deep. Good thing we can swim. For those of you guys who can't swim, The right attitude. The right attitude can smile when things are going haywire. The right attitude allows you to laugh when everybody else is feeling sorry for themselves. The right attitude. The right attitude. If you can do these four things consistently, you will win wherever you are. And, and, and your teams, your teams will be magnificent if they just see somebody execute these four things consistently. Lieutenants, lieutenants, I've been saying this as I've been here, and I know you hear it all the time, and this is probably the one that you hear the most. Trust your NCOs, trust your NCOs, trust your NCOs. And yes, I do want you to trust your NCOs. That's probably the thing that's hammered in your brain the most. But I would like to humbly Hammer this in your brain, too. Ask questions. Ask questions. We know you're new. We know you're new. And just asking a question, it doesn't make you look any more new. It doesn't. There's not like, there's not like rungs of new. And for, the, and, for the, and for the lieutenant that asks questions, you get demoted a little bit. No, it doesn't work that way. Be able to say when you've missed it. Be able to admit that you've made a mistake. Have the guts and the courage enough to say, hey, I missed it this time. Have the guts. It takes courage. It takes courage to stand before the platoon and say, hey, look, hey, I made a mistake. I thought the CEO said fill uh, 30 sandbags. We filled 300. Sorry about that. <laughs> takes guts. Takes guts. But what's worse is the, the lieutenant that can't admit it and say, well, he said field 30. That's the worst. That's the worst. It's the worst. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. I, uh, I wanted to share this with you because this is something that, uh, that I feel so deeply about. And this is something that I hope you can share. But great leaders, great leaders, General Buzzard, General Williams, generals that, 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 that I grew up with, these generals, these great leaders, these great leaders all had one, one thing in common, and it's this. They were all tremendous followers. If you aspire to be a great leader, You must, you must be committed to being a great follower. And what does great follower, what does a great follower mean? A great follower means even when I cannot see the outcome of what's going on, I can carry out the task that's given to me. Because I don't have all the details explained to me, I can still execute the task and I can do my part of the mission. I can do it without complaining. Being a good follower is when General Buzzer tells me, go attack that position. And I know, I know that over there, there's trouble. And I know my men know it's trouble. I'm not blaming him for telling me to go over there. I'm assuming responsibility for going over there. I say to the men, I say, hey, look, this is where we're going. Well, why we got to do it? Because I said we got to do it. Not because, well, the general said we got to go do it. That's a poor follower. That's a poor follower. Passing off the buck to your boss when you know that you got to get the mission done is being a poor follower. I hated it. I hated it when I heard young officers say, oh, because the captain said we got to do it. No, it needs to be done. So I say we got to go do it. I own it. 
not pass it off to my boss. Being a good follower is so important. If you are a bad follower, the problem with being a bad follower is this. When you do assume command, you assume that everybody is going to have the same attributes as you did. You'll say things like this, well, let me go and check on them, because I know the sandbags aren't all the way full. You're assuming that they had the same habits that you had. You're assuming that they're going to take shortcuts like you took shortcuts. And there's nothing worse than, than, than a leader that thinks you're doing the wrong thing when you're really doing the right thing. It hurts. When you were doing the right thing and, the, and, your, and your leader said you were doing the wrong thing. Not because you were, but because they did the wrong thing. Oh, it hurts. And it's just, it spreads like a, like a toxic cancer. I knew when that man looked in my eyes and he told me to do something. He must have been a good follower because when, when he told me to do something, he expected that it was going to get done, and he believed in me. And just like there's nothing worse than when you're doing the right thing and a leader thinks that you're doing the wrong thing, it's nothing better than when a leader is expecting you to do the right thing and you're doing the right thing. You carry a lot of power, not by the rank that you will wear, but by the expectation that you share. The expectation is where your influence truly comes in at. They know you're the boss and you don't have a lot of experience, but when you can look someone in their eye and say, I know you're gonna get it done, and I know I don't have to check up on you, Hey, just let me know when it's done. That feels terrific. That feels terrific. And it can spread. It can spread the core of your teams will go through the roof. Be a great follower. Be a great follower. The next thing is this. If you aspire to be a good leader, I think at the very core of leadership, you got to be a great leader of you. A great leader of you. Now, I'm saying this from experience because there have been times where I've been a poor leader of me. And when I have been a poor leader of me, I tend to get the men that I deserve. I shared this with the class a little bit earlier. And the quote goes something like this. The leader typically gets the team member that they deserve. The leader typically gets the team member that they deserve. Now, maybe not in the beginning. When you show up, maybe you'll have a platoon with a couple knuckleheads. That's not what you deserve. But if you stick around long enough and you're being a good leader of yourself, you're being a good follower to others, sooner or later, your environment will change. And those knuckleheads who were knuckleheads will turn into better people or they will not be able to be allowed in your organization. Being a good leader of you is tremendous. It's hard to ask of, of, of someone to go and run five miles when I can only do four. It's hard to ask you to shine your shoes when I can't shine mine. It's very hard to tell somebody to go get a haircut if your hair isn't cut. Being a good leader of you, being a good leader of you is paramount. It's paramount. These are just things that I see as an enlisted guy, as a platoon sergeant, as a first sergeant. There have been times where, and I'll be honest, there have been times where I've been a bad platoon sergeant. I've been a bad Sergeant, a bad example of the non-commissioned officer corps, where I was so insecure of me, when I get a young lieutenant, I want to beat him up. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> Sergeant, come out of me. I want to I wanna let him know I'm in charge, so I'm going to rough him up and tell him, you sit there and you don't. No, that guy's going to be a company commander pretty soon, and he's going to think that that's the way we're supposed to act. Maybe one day you'll be a company commander. You have to understand that pretty soon that lieutenant's going to be somebody's company commander, and you're passing off bad habits to the next person. Be a great leader of you first. Maybe no greater time to do it than here when you don't have a platoon waiting for orders. This is the last chance you're going to get to practice at it before you go full speed. I learned this lesson probably by mistake. I had a young soldier that had some, some pay issues. And this is where you get rabid, rabid followership, all right? All your soldiers aren't going to be single. Some of them are going to be married. And this is where some leaders think that this is a weakness. The soldier can't give me everything because he's got to split his time with not just me, but with his family. But this is a very unique opportunity for you to take the high ground on leadership. And it's this right here. Care for the families just as much as you would want your family to be taken care of. Now, it's very, very, probably a high percentage of you will probably go into your first platoon leader position single, single. I would imagine, I would imagine. Unless you guys are having a million weddings coming up in a few months, probably a lot of you be single. But that's a great opportunity. PFC Jacob Bell from Texas. He's a little bit older than a normal private, and he had some pay issues. And the Army had, had done something to his pay, and he wasn't getting paid, but he still had bills. Now, he wasn't asking me for money, although money would have fixed it. But really what he wanted to know was if he needed somebody there, would somebody care for him and his wife and his little kids? At the time, his kids were in diapers. We kept asking for how we can fix the problem. We would go to the lending closets, Army Community Service. We would seek out agencies that could help soldiers in this particular case. Now, he did not look at the ACS or the, the lending closet as the heroes. He looked at the, the fact that I gave a damn, that I continued to knock on doors to make sure that him and his family were going to be all right tonight. And not just one soldier, but when you could continue to do that, the single guys will begin to trust you because they know that you care about somebody other than yourself. And I'm not telling you, these are things that I had to lift through. I had to see this. I had to see this. A good leader can balance the hammer and the heart. The hammer and the heart. A good leader knows when to pour it on knows when to pour it on and make you know that you did wrong, but at the same time can put his arms around you and say, I know you did wrong. I'm going to hammer you, but I'm going to also help you back up again. That guy right there could hammer and hug. Now, I know he may not feel like he's hugging you right now, but he's got a hammer in one hand, and he's ready to hug in the other. Good leaders know when to balance both. If you think about a good parent, they know when to skin you up, but they also know when to put their arms around you. Great leaders, great leaders know how to get the most out of you with the hammer. 
but they know that the hammer is not for all circumstances. Great leaders know that the hug isn't for all circumstances. It's not. Experience will tell you when to use the hammer and when to use the hug. Don't be so caught up in, I got power for the first time. Don't do that. I did that as a young corporal. Corporal is a weird rank, and you're going to run into him. It's a weird rank. It's the first time you get real power to make people do push-ups. You can, make, you can make a PFC. You were just the PFC's buddy. Now you're the same rank as them. Or now, they, now you're one rank higher than them. And now you can make your buddy do push-ups legally. <laughs> a corporal most time is 20, 21 years old, maybe. Sometimes 19. You're getting ready to be given a whole lot of horsepower. If you've ever had a car with a whole lot of horsepower and you're really young, you'll tear the car up. The tires will be bald by Halloween. I gave a whole lot of horsepower to a young person. Same thing, just like you tear up the tires on a Mustang, you tear up your platoon. You're running ragged. And you won't run him ragged because you think it's necessary. You're running ragged because I want to impress this guy so bad. I want to impress this guy. I want to let him know how good I am. And I want to go out there and I want to take my men out on the weekends and we're going to be training on the weekends. No, that's, that's running the tires ball. That's running the tires, running the tread off the tires. It's going to be time for that. It's going to be time for it. But don't do that. Don't do that. Talk with your leaders. Talk with your NCOs. Your NCOs will tell you, hey, this ain't the time for them uh, uh, running up and down the post on the weekend trying to impress the CO. This ain't the time for that. It's a four-day weekend. They don't need to be training on uh, machine gun techniques to impress the CO. will not be time for that, though. there will be time for that. This is very important right here. Leadership was more about caring for the mission and the men more than the next leader. The mission and the men. A lot like the hug and the hammer, the mission and the men. If you can balance those two, I know there's a great book out there called The Men, The Mission and Me. Is that, is that about right? If you can balance those two, those three, if you can take the mission and know when it's time to pour it on for the mission, and when you're pouring it on for the mission, sometimes the care and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the focus on you and the men maybe go back a little bit. But then there are times where the men take the forefront, the care of the men, the focus on the men may at some point in time be even more important than the mission. And then this is exceptionally important. Please hear this there are going to be times where you have to take priority over the men and the mission. Those are the times where you have to take a step back and you have to get time for yourself. If you're not allowing you to have the forefront at any time, you're going to do what we call tracer burnout. You're going to go, you're going to go strong for a little while and then you'll flare out. People say, what happened to LT? What happened to him? He was just here. He's over at Sitco. What, what's going on? Go check on him. You got to have certain times where each particular element has 
the right amount of focus. There's the right amount of focus. Now, I do want to talk about this. Those are things that I know for a fact. If you were to employ these things when you first get to Fort Bragg, or you first get to Fort Campbell, or you first get to Fort wherever you're going, if you would employ these things consistently, I think your time as a lieutenant would be pretty sweet. It'd be pretty sweet. But if you overlook this one thing that I'm about to tell you, you blow it all. It's the, it's the need to be liked. It's the need to be liked. I've seen lieutenants. I, I look, I've been a sergeant who wanted to be liked, who loved to be liked. When you first step in front of the men and they're laughing at your jokes, it is almost amazing. It's like a, it's euphoric almost. They're laughing at your jokes. Or, or when you have a good idea and they say, well, let's just do what the LT said. It's going to feel incredible. You're going to be like a collection of enlisted men just told me I had the best idea. It's going to feel like you are now Patton or MacArthur somebody. Your, your chin's gonna be a little bit higher than it was before. And your chest is gonna poke out a little bit more. And you're gonna, you're gonna stand a little bit different in pictures. <laughs> and when you take selfies, <laughs> you'll be a better smile than it's ever been. That's just the way that it is. When the opinion of the men get held in too high regard, though, then you begin to take a little bit of a dive. Because you're, you're living for the cheers. If you live for the cheers, you'll die for the booze. If you're living for the cheers of the men, when they're not cheering for you, it'll feel even worse. It'll feel terrible. It'll cut your heart out. Because, because now you're on, on a seesaw. You're on a seesaw right now, and you can't win. The only way to win is to go in there and do what you know is right, whether they like it or not. Do what you know to be true, whether they like it or not. Follow the compass that you know this place has built. Follow the compass that you know good leaders have, have built inside you. Now, the next part about being a lieutenant has a lot to do with you being a soldier. I need you to show this first video. You guys got this video up there. Uh, cue the, the second YouTube clip. And, and please uh, keep your finger close to the pause button. All right, go ahead and play it real quick. As long as I'm going to be promoting this fight myself, I want a lot more pressure put on for a rematch. Hey, we can get the same money for the two top contenders. Why go after real quick? Why? Because there's still a lot. I'm not sure. I know it's a lot of young people in here right now, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with this movie. But if you're not, take some time between now and tomorrow and just get the gist of the movie. This is all time classic movie right here. This, this movie alone can turn you into a pretty decent soldier right here. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's in General Buzz's hometown. It's a patriotic movie. In this movie, well, first of all, who, who has not seen this movie? Raise your hand. Who has no clue what this movie is? All right, it's a new generation, all right? It's a new generation. This here is called Rocky Part Two. <laughs> Rocky Part Two. Probably the best Rocky in my opinion, but Rocky Part Two. Take that, put that in your notes. <laughs> All American classic movie. But in Rocky Part Two, on one hand, we have a fighter. In Rocky Part One, Rocky is an unknown fighter, and he gets a chance to fight the heavyweight champion of the world. Now, keep in mind, Rocky is basically a loan shark's bodyguard. He goes and beats people up when they don't have loan shark's money. He's a part-time club fighter. And the, and the champ wants to fight a nobody to let People know that this is the greatest country in the world. We'll take a nobody and give them a shot at the title. 
Rocky represents each one of us. Now, in the first movie, Rocky goes head to head with the champ. Head to head with the champ and goes all, but well, back then, all 15 rounds. All 15 rounds. Now, in Rocky Part 2, Apollo is pissed because he beat Rocky only by decision. In this particular confrontation, or this particular uh, uh, vignette, we have the champ, which is right there holding that piece of paper, Apollo, and he's explaining to his team that he, he won the fight, but he didn't beat him. I want you to think about times in your life that, yes, you qualified at the range. Barely. You passed the PT test by a hair, a fraction of a second. 54, 55, 50. I don't know why we get closer to the line as we're counting. 59, uh, 59 and a half, 60. Like this has something to do with you getting there. It does. But, but, I will tell you this. If there have been times in your life where you know for a fact you didn't give her your all. That is exactly what you'll feel like. The moment that you take a shortcut and you barely pass, you knew you could have given more. This is what you're going to feel like. Go ahead and play it. A lot of people out there that think he won. There's a lot of people out there accusing me of having a fight fixed, accusing me of being a fake and insulting my kids in school. That's why. You want to hear the truth? Yeah, I want to hear the truth. The truth is that last time he was damn lucky. Now he's all finished. I mean, he's been hanging around doing nothing for six months. And any trainer worth anything wouldn't have nothing to do with it. Now I say, let's go after some new meat. Forget this bum. Tune in. Listen to this. You think I beat him the last time, do you? Hmm? You got the decision. Man, I won, but I didn't beat him. What are you afraid of, Tony? Honest? Yeah, honest. He's all wrong for us, baby. It's my favorite part. I saw you beat that man like I never saw no man get beat before. And the man kept coming after you. Pause it, please. I can't take it no more. It's about to explode. <laughs> As a lieutenant, you must have that gear inside you that you know you can take a little bit of disappointment. This guy, Rocky, he's not in the clip right now, but he got beat and he got beat and he failed and he failed and he failed and he failed and he, failed and he kept coming after the champ. Do you have that kind of tenacity in you right now? You've always been the smartest people in the room. You come here, and now there's a student in your class that knows spaceship theory. <laughs> How do you compete with that? Nothing you ever do will matter. He knows how to get to Neptune on a milk crate if he wanted to. <laughs> this, this is the kind of fighter that I'm talking about you must be. Intellect out the window. Are you able to know that maybe you're not measuring up today or tomorrow or the day after that, but you are tough enough to play the long game? You're tough enough to play the long game and say, yeah, I might not measure up right now. And I might not measure up tomorrow. I might not be the best platoon leader in the battalion today. But the way I work and, and, and with the ferocity that I work and, and with the work ethic that I have, I'll be the best lieutenant that I can be. 
and that will be enough. Remember this, remember this. Better is better than best. Once you become the top lieutenant in the battalion, you pretty much are now the target, but what about if you are the better lieutenant than you were yesterday? And even better than that tomorrow, and a year from now, even better. Hopefully you're a captain in a couple years. But what about if you continuously are better than yesterday? That must be the goal. Not I got to be the best in the battalion. That's finite. That is a finish line. But what about if you can be the better you than yesterday? What if, what if, what if when you go to the range, you barely qualified at your unit, you shoot a 30, I don't know. But with reps, you're going to the range on the weekend. And you're getting better and better on your own time. You can be better tomorrow, and you can be better the day after that. That has everything to do with being a fighter. No, I'm not talking about being a soldier. I'm talking about being a fighter. For a long time, for many years, I was a soldier, but I wasn't a fighter. I wasn't a fighter. It's a difference between being a soldier and being a fighter. It's a difference between being a, a lieutenant and being a fighter. It's a difference between being a, a, a mom and a fighter, a dad and a fighter. A fighter will respond with effort, whereas maybe a soldier won't. A boxer, a boxer will respond with technique, whereas a fighter will respond with effort. Effort and technique, effort and planning, effort and scheme. Be a fighter. Be a fighter, not just a soldier. Be a fighter, man. Have something inside of you that when people see you, they get just one moment to see you. And on your good days, you celebrate. On your bad days, you got to know that you're going to come back and give them better. Your platoon, they're gonna, they're, bro, they're gonna blow it. They're gonna blow it. You're gonna get the call in the middle of the night when you just got to bed on the weekend and somebody's gonna be down at the Cumberland County Correctional Facility. You gotta come and bail them out. And not only do you gotta come and bail them out, you gotta come and tell uh, Lieutenant Colonel Buzzard at the time, hey, listen, uh, Eagle's downtown and we blew it. I, he's, I, yeah, I briefed him, sir. I, I briefed him. I did. But he did it anyway. You got to have the tenacity to come back tomorrow morning and say, hey, we're up. We're ready to go. It's ballsy. It's ballsy. But that's the person you got to be when you leave here. Courage. I think I'll, I'll leave it on this, courage. Courage is, is so, courage and attitude, courage and attitude. Attitude is up there, probably at the top of my books, but courage, over the years I found that courage is so important. When I know that you can look at your boss and know that you're putting you're, or he may be putting your men in danger or, or whatever the circumstances. You can still say, hey, this is wrong. Can you look at the platoon sergeant that, that has way more experience than you and say, hey, no, this is not right. This is a false report. Without courage, man, we can't really do nothing with you. Because, because when times get tight, you'll fold. 
You let fear dictate. Have some guts about you when you leave here. If you got nothing else, if you can't run fast, if you can't shoot straight, you got courage, you always have a place. You always have a place. Now, you're not leaving here until we get some questions. It's just the way it's going to be. It's the way it's going to be. Now, I've spoken at a lot of places, a lot of colleges, a lot of high schools, a lot of high schools. Now, this is the premier leadership academy in the world. No pressure. But I'm about to open it up for questions. And when I open it up for questions, I'll tell you this. Nothing is off the table. If you say, well, Sergeant, how in the world did you get back to running? I'll tell you how. I say, how in the world did you get to where you could you know, run marathon? I'll tell you how. Say, how in the world did you drive your car without wrecking on 495? I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. So, without any further ado, question time in three, two, one, Mark. All right, mics, runners, ready, get set, go. All right, look, hey. All right, I just talked about courage, men and, and soldiers. Sorry, working on being an infant. There we go. There we go. We got the ballsiest lieutenant ever right here. So, Lieutenant. Hey, sir. Uh, Cadet Blackman. I'm in Trolley Company, 3rd Reg. And uh, one of my questions for you is, we're going to get out there, but I want to know what are LT supposed to do? Like, when we get free time, how do we manage to not go do something crazy? Like, how do you, like, incorporate that discipline with Understanding you have some excellent under- question. Golly, what's your name? Lieutenant who? Or cadet who? Blackman. Blackman, sir. I'm not even gonna try that, all right? Oh. It's an echo in here, so I- I'll probably miss it. Cadet, I hey, I appreciate it. Great question. <laughs> how do you all right, let me make sure I'm asking it right. How do you not blow it on your free time? How do you how do you keep yourself from doing something stupid on your free time? First of all, you need to know this. Your free time is very valuable. Your time is actually more valuable than the money you get paid every month. If you don't think so, go try and buy another week. See if anybody's selling weeks out there. (laughs) Anybody selling weeks on eBay? You'll make a fortune. Your time is so valuable. And what you do in your free time will determine how valuable you will become. What you're doing in your free time, are you adding value to your time? Are you adding value to your time? Put value with your time. If you, you, got, you guys got the best library. I mean, I, I just went up to the, to the, they got a library here with the best, it's like Barnes and Noble on steroids here. Like, Really, continue to make your time valuable. Your time is already valuable, but you adding value to your time will make you exponentially a great leader. What books are you reading? What are you doing with your time? And please understand, these days, you got this device right here that's got three little cameras on the back of it. I don't even know why it's got three cameras on it now. You only used to have one. But this thing right here could be the detriment of you as a lieutenant. Because it takes time. It takes time. You scroll through your timeline only intending to post something of value. And you go through and world star, what in the world? Did you see this? Oh, well, you should see this one right here. Go to YouTube, pull this up. And next thing you know, you got 10 minutes in, 20 minutes, an hour in to something that's taking away value from the time. Make, make sure you're always adding value to your time. You got an hour, make sure you create value for that hour. Do I mean you got to be in the books forever? No. No. 
I think on your off time, also, you got to watch out for this one. This is another toe popper right here. No pun intended. This is another one. Is this right here? Your soldiers are going to be the coolest people, probably in the battalion, probably. When you, when you get in front of your soldiers, they are going to be throwing parties on the weekend, and they're going to be the same age as you. Their parties are going to rival what you would have gotten if you went to another institution. <laughs> so you're going to automatically think, this is my time. I can make it back up. I can party right here and make up for all the lost time. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. The next thing you know, you'll be standing right there telling the colonel what happened on Saturday night at 2.25, approximately East Coast time, you know? You don't want to do that. Make sure you don't fall into the trap of being your soldier's buddy. They're another one of the gang because they're going to try you. You're going to be the coolest. You're going to be the next coolest person that they could hang out with. They're going to hang out with Sergeant King. I got a wifey kids, and even if I did want to hang out with them, they're playing Sega. I guess they don't have Sega no more. What they got? Uh, PlayStation? Nintendo. They got, something, they got games they're playing. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm a little bit older. They had Sega when I came in, all right? <laughs> Sega. They only have Sega. <laughs> PlayStation. Do they even still have PlayStation 2? <laughs> they have it? No? Right when I got married, PlayStation 2 was real hot. It was like the hottest thing out there. But yeah, they're going to ask you, hey, ma'am, hey, sir, won't you come up and play the new uh, Grand Theft Auto game? They'd be like, you got it? World of Warcraft, come on up and play. We just got it. We need another player. You know, I couldn't hurt. And now, now, what you don't know is you've gone from being a lieutenant to being the third wing, the wing man, the wing woman on a cool date in the middle of, of downtown. Not with other lieutenants, not with your mentors. You're going out there with your guys and gals. There's no future in that. It's a time when to, when to be social. It'll be time. I ain't going to be on the first day. I ain't going to be on the first day. Two things. Add value to your time. Add value to your time. Make your time valuable. And your time will make you valuable. And two, don't fall into those time traps. It's almost impossible to turn off your phone. It's almost impossible. When you show up to the unit, they're going to give you a phone probably. You give lieutenants phones these days? No. There will be a time where you will be given a phone. <laughs> Other than the one you pay for. And you're going to wish you didn't have it. Make your time valuable. Your time will make you valuable. Excellent question. Excellent question. Give it up for the LT. I mean, a cadet. 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 <laughs> give it up. No, the first question? This is the person where if you get in a fight, she'll probably throw the first punch. That's who you want on your team right there, all right? That's who you want on your team. The person to ask the first question, guts. Another question. We got Mike runners out there. Who we uh, got up top? Master Sergeant uh, Cadet Milton. Cadet so Milton. You were talking uh, about being better each day versus being the best. Being the best platoon in the battalion is a pretty concrete goal. You get there, your platoon says, we feel awesome about it. But uh, just being better each day is kind of vague. So how do you suggest you keep that fire going? I used your to... soldiers and yourself. Hey, hey, bro, hey, excellent, excellent, excellent question. Golly. How, how do you become better? It's, it's so vague. How do you become better every day? I think it goes back to, to what I just said. You got to make sure that you're adding value to your time. Do you, do you know how a soldier should look when they go to the promotion board? Do you know what it takes for a, a soldier that's overweight to come within regs, to come back within regs? 
Do you know how to go to the S1 and help your soldiers with pay problems? Do you know your regs? Do you know how to fight for your soldiers? Do you know how to keep them out of trouble? To win the best platoon in the battalion, did you talk to the last guy who won the best platoon in the battalion? Are you spending time with mentors that are going to make you better? Are you investing some of your time to make sure that your men, your soldiers are going to be better? Are you, in, are you investing your personal time? Ooh. Starting to get a little sticky in here. Are you investing your personal time to making sure that your soldiers are getting the benefit? The only thing that lasts is the sacrifices you make for others. That's the only thing that's going to live on. Now, yes, there are going to be sacrifices that you make for yourself. You paid a dollar, uh, or you paid $11 for a haircut at the PX, and maybe they messed it up. That's a sacrifice you made. <laughs> a sacrifice you made. You went to the wrong barber. You made a sacrifice. The true sacrifice is this. The men just came back from a 30-miler, from a 30-miler. They're dead tired. You make the stunning move of taking all the soldiers that couldn't make the road march, and you make sure that they come and help out and pitch in where your soldiers can kind of get a little bit of a break. It's thinking a little bit ahead of the target. Your, your soldiers, are, they love you. They love you forever. Are you making sacrifices? Being a little bit better of a leader than, 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 than you really want to be? Are you being a leader that where you go in and you're a little bit afraid? Being a little bit better. Being a little bit better is this. I, the, the guys, uh, this, was a, this was a classic case. Uh, I had a guy that was, uh, that was a little overweight, and we would run on the weekends. We'd run on the weekends. This guy was probably, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe 5% over, I don't know. He was a little bit percentage over on weighing and tape. He had like a real thin neck, but a huge body or something. It was really, really, really bad, really bad for weigh and tape standards. And, and um, I would talk to his wife. I would say, hey, listen, he can't have this, 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 this. I'll call him at night and say, hey, well, how many, how many miles did you get in uh, after work today? On the weekends. Hey, look, we got two runs on the weekends. I'm sacrificing my time for the good of the lowest guy on the, on the totem pole. This guy ended up naming his son after me. Now, that's something that he didn't have to do. It's something I appreciate, but that says something about the sacrifice that I made. I, I'd forgotten all about that, that we'd even done those workouts. Uh, PFC Jacob Bell, his wife came over to me uh, one day after he had gotten promoted. She pinned the ranks on one collar, I pinned the ranks on the other collar. And she said, I don't know if you didn't help us out with, with, in that time we were, we were out, where the pay was messed up, if you didn't help us out, I don't know where we'd be at right now. That's, that's a wife coming to tell you about how she appreciates what you did for a family. Best platoon, it's incredible, it's incredible, it's incredible. But I will tell you what, when a family member comes up and says, hey, look, you made the difference, maybe the battalion commander won't know it, but you'll know it. And, and what's more important, you'll be able to do this again and again and again because you know it has proof of concept. You know it works. And 
And the soldiers that don't have families, they'll see it. Builds up the morale. Do the right thing for the people that need you the most. You do that, best battalion, platoon, best platoon in battalion, it'll be easy. It'll be easy. You ain't got to make PT fun, but you can make it competitive. You can make it competitive. And when you make it competitive, it'll be fun. Let me just share one thing, too, and, and an interesting question. You sit down. If, uh, hey, don't think the best platoon, I mean, you've got to define with your platoon sergeant what being the best really is. And, and, and I would tell you that I think the, the best platoons out there, at least when I was a battalion and brigade commander, were the ones that had the most cohesion, were the ones that I knew I could rely on to get the mission done, even in the worst, worst circumstances. They weren't necessarily, you know, ideally they had good, you know, you, you generally want to be somewhere near the top, but you don't, if you're striving to always be near the top, you're going to, you know, you're going to set a false expectation and people are going to think you're more focused on kind of objective uh, statistics than, um, than caring for your people. So, um, again, I think it's more about esprit de corps. It's about a, a unit that people can trust to get, the, to get the job done. And I think if you read Red Platoon this semester, you'll see a platoon that was that platoon. They may not have had any of the stats on being the best necessary at anything, but they were, there was a platoon that their uh, company commander and their battalion commander could rely on in the, in the absolute worst circumstances. With that, well, uh, I know we're at uh, Cedric will hang around up front afterwards. I know we're about, about done with time. Um, I just had written a couple notes, I think, to take with you. One is genuinely care about your people. Those of you, when I've had the opportunity to sit down with the leadership, taking time to really care about those you lead is important. And I'd ask you, you should be thinking about now and having a notebook, how am I going to get across to my organization that I actually give a crap about them? You know, I, I used to do this with company commanders. Some would call soldiers on the weekend to check in on them. Some would take that time to be at PT in the afternoon, remedial PT, to do it with them. Some, there's a variety of different things that you've got to think about. Some writing letters to their moms and dads as soon as that new soldier shows up to your unit. There's a letter that goes out to that mom and dad knowing that you're going to take care of them, you and the platoon sergeant. When they get promoted, making a big deal out of it. When they leave the company, making sure their award's in on time and you're pinning that thing on before they leave. There's a lot of things you can think about. Taking care of people, getting better every day, he talked about it, learning through failure, you're gonna fail. I failed all the time, you're gonna fail out there. It's are you gonna put your shields up and fight it or are you gonna absorb it and you're gonna, you're gonna approach that next day just like he talked about in terms of getting better and then, uh, and then your responsibility to motivate others even in, even in the toughest circumstances. So. You know, he didn't talk one iota about all the challenges uh, he's been through, all the failure he's had to overcome. Uh, but I can't think of anybody that's worked harder, and you saw a little bit of that in the video, to get back to being able to be up and about and walking and a great example for others. So just inclusion, let's give him a round of applause and thanks for your attention today.